Welcome to the Startup Grind. Give me a big cheer if you're excited to hear from Evan and hear the story of One Fast Set. That's pretty good. That's not bad. All right. Well then, please help me welcome Evan Frank to the stage, founder, co-founder of One Fast Set. All right, thanks for joining us, Evan. Thanks for having me, and thanks yeah. to Pivotal as well, which yeah. is a great space, thank you. Yeah, super nice. Um, and you were just, uh, yeah, so why don't we dig right in? I, I think uh, clearly a lot of people have heard of One Fine Stay, not a lot of people have used it before, so why don't we uh, dig into the, the meat of the subject? So can you just tell us what One Fine Stay is and tell us a little bit more about the company? Sure, so there's, there's an elephant in the room, and we'll talk about the elephant, but we really think of our business as a hotel, but it's a hotel that's spread across New York City. It's also spread across London, Paris, and LA, and it's comprised of the most unique and distinctive, not necessarily all high-end, but certainly unique and distinctive properties that the city has to offer. So in a city like New York, that would be Soho Lofts, West Village, or you know, Fort Greene townhomes, we have a carriage house in the West Village. Uh, so really, the, the, the most characterful and interesting real estate that the city has to offer. But we're fundamentally a hospitality company and we're a services company, and we'll talk about that yeah. quite a bit. But we really identify ourselves uh, as a hospitality business. And we're now offering guests the opportunity to stay in up to 500, um, or choose from up to 500 properties in New York, even more in London, um, and have a really unique, one-of-a-kind, great New York experience. So one of the things you pointed out to me right off the bat is that something like a, a very high percentage, most of the properties that you work with are actually owned yeah. as opposed to rented, right? Yeah, so over 95% of our homes in New York are owned, which is a little unusual because New York real estate is actually mostly rentals. Most of us probably live in rentals, 70%. Um, um, but we focused from the very beginning on owned homes and in rental situations, and this is really what differentiates us on the supply side from Airbnb, um, we only work in situations where we actually have the permission of the landlord. So there's nothing kind of funny going on. Yeah. Well, so right off the bat, the elephant in the room that you mentioned is clearly Airbnb. Sure. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure that One Fine Stay gets a lot of comparisons to Airbnb. We do. Um, <laughs> is that... Um, how does that work? I mean, do you, can you say, yeah, we're the Airbnb for this? Or, or how do you position yourselves compared to Airbnb? We try to not anchor ourselves to Airbnb, yeah. um, even though they have achieved a ton of success. And, and by the way, we're huge fans of those guys. They're really nice people, and they're good at what they do. Mm -hmm. um, but we really differentiate on two key dimensions. One is the fact that we're a full service business to both our homeowners, or hosts as we call them, as well as guests. So you're getting something that's much more analogous on the guest side to a, uh, a, a hotel experience. Mm -hmm. um, and on the host side, we're doing all of the work. So it's kind of the, the opposite of Airbnb in that respect. It's not at all self-catered. We coordinate all of the activities associated with offering your home um, to guests. We welcome the guests on arrival, handle any issues that arise during their stay, um, uh, rectify any, any problems which happen, of course, in homes. We have a full property management and maintenance capability. Um, so it does look quite different. If you, if you came into our office, you'd see how different it is from, from you know, a bunch of engineers. Right. Um, so, so like Airbnb is essentially an online platform. Like they, don't, they aren't really doing a lot of offline work the way that One Fine Stay is actually much more involved in the entire process. Yeah, so we're, you know, to use a, a tech term, we're, we're full stack. Um, Airbnb does do some customer service. They do have an insurance policy. Um, and there is an ecosystem, as I'm sure you guys are aware of, um, of, of, of Airbnb services companies that are facilitating the experience. But our homeowners work with us because they're looking for somebody to take the hassle out of offering their home on an occasional basis or on a more regular basis. Right, so uh, you know, out of curiosity, what percentage of the properties are essentially being um, rented out full time versus uh, properties that people actually live in and occasionally rent through one fine set? So it's, it, I mean, basically 0% are being okay. rented out full time. 
Okay. So nearly all of our homes, and there's a couple edge cases, but nearly all of our homes are real people's homes that are only occasionally empty. Mm -hmm. They're not in all cases primary, uh, primary residences. In some cases, they are secondary residences. But actually, the majority of the time, it's a seasonally available home. Summer's a super busy time for us because a lot of people leave town and a lot of people come to town. Um, uh, most of the time, there are pr real people's homes that are occasionally empty. Okay. And um, so you're based in New York City, but the company was actually launched in the UK. In right? London, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, how does that uh, how does that work? Like how how is your workforce split up between the two comp between the two cities? How uh, how do you, and then how do you manage, well, so you're actually, in, you have properties in four different cities now, right? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So London was just our first, and it's also where we retain a lot of our headquarters. Got it. So, so then how does the workforce split up between those two cities, and, and I guess uh, between London, New York, and then your two other cities? So all of our cities are operating hubs. I would think of them as the hotel. We have a hotel in, um, in London, New York, Paris, and, and LA. Um, London got a head start, so that's where our largest operation is. We started, I, I moved back to, to New York from London in 2012 to launch One Fine Stay in New York. Um, and New York is our second city and our second largest operation. Um, total headcount in New York, again, it's seasonal and people are coming and going quite a lot. Um, but on a full-time equivalent basis, it's probably about 70, 75 people, yep. um, uh, which includes a warehouse in the Brooklyn Navy Yards and our mm. kind of West Soho, Hudson Square, uh, uh, New York office. Um, London has probably uh, 120, something like that, people in the operating teams, but also that's where our finance team sits, it's where our engineering um, and product team sit, um, it's where our, uh, mo most of our marketing team sits, so it's kind of HQ, and we're a matrixed organization, which is complicated. Um, but we do think of New York and the US as really an operating hub, where there are some headquarter type roles, but it's mostly about service delivery. What do you mean by a matrixed organization? What I mean is we have a headquarters that is providing services to four different markets, okay. London being one of those markets. Gotcha. Um, there's no easy way to expand internationally, especially when you're trying to keep um, you know, brand equity and, and quality really high. Um, so you, know, you also need to think about where you're going to concentrate costs and how you're gonna figure out like, the, the scaling model and building an acquisition marketing team. And uh, you know, I mean, a lot of this stuff just doesn't make sense. You can consolidate and get the economies of scale by being in one location. You should do that, which is what we've done. Gotcha. Cool. So uh, I'm really curious how, like, I'm really curious to dive into the background of Evan Frank. Like, obviously, so um, you've been working on One Fine Stay since 2010. Yeah, it's been. F I just had my five-year anniversary. Oh, congratulations! Yeah, thank you. Um, but but what's your background? I mean, where did you really get started in the entrepreneurship game? Sure. Um, you're the first person that's ever said you really want to dig into the background of Evan Frank's very, very, very flattering. I'm sure that's not true. Yeah, I think it might be. Um, so I started off my career uh, in traditional uh, corporate finance. Um, so I was a tech investment banker, right, as in a not very fun time um, in the tech industry when the Web 1 bubble was, was uh, deflating rapidly. Um, and I, w I was hired into the job before it had popped and then I yeah. kind of wrote it out. Yeah. Um, but since the very beginning of my career, I've spent time trying to get closer to the entrepreneur. I had a web one startup when I was at college um, or university um, and um, following taking a, an investment banking job, um, but working in a technology boutique, so working with tech companies. Um, I got the opportunity to join um, a buy side firm, a venture capital firm in London, which is what took me to London for the first time. For me, it was also a really good way to marry adventure um, with career progression. Um, so I, I took the opportunity to move to London. That was back in 2005. Uh, and I was a venture capitalist for- Adventure versus venture? Like, but, like adventure as in moving to London and- That part was in adventure. Right. Uh, it, it seemed exotic at the time, but there's like you know tons of Americans in London. Um, <laughs> But it was something that none of my friends had done, I guess, at that point. Um, and uh, spent some time in the buy side um, in venture capital work, sitting on the other side of the table from a lot of growth companies. 
Um, and I had a, a, a sort of a life, you know, um, light bulb moment, I guess, uh, right around the time that I turned 30. Mm. Um, and in, not that, you know, not like a quarter life or third life crisis or anything like that, but just feeling like if I really wanted to start my own company, and it looked like a lot of fun because I spoke to entrepreneurs all the time for my day job, now was really the time to do it. Mm. So uh, right around that time, I did what was financially irrational, and I quit a fairly comfortable venture capital job uh, and started an e-commerce business um, in London. And I was subletting space from Greg, Tim, and Demetrius, my co-founders, uh, um, with my e-commerce startup. And one day I just decided, you know what, I, th this is cool, but I really don't like being a, like a sole entrepreneur. Right. I felt like the biggest risk was that I spent five or ten years building something that only ended up being average. Um, and if that was the case, maybe I'd make some money, but, but, but I wouldn't learn the lessons that you learn from being part of a team and really scaling a business globally. Well, so, so from an investment banking and venture capital background, how do you, how do you go from that to making, as you said, a, a financially irrational decision? Yeah. Like, what were the drivers? Because obviously finances were not the only aspect. I no, I mean, I, I really shouldn't be doing this uh, <laughs> if it's only about the money. Um, I, you know, I think that, I think that perhaps I was, I was not as self-aware um, as others are about specifically what they want early on in their career. And I kind of did what I thought I should be doing. Um, I, I always blame my parents, of course, which is uh, the thing to do. Uh, it's not really their fault, but I remember, um, you know, uh, when I was in college, not knowing what I wanted to do after school, my dad being like, well, yeah, you got to go get like an investment banking job. And I was like, yeah, you know what, I should go get an investment banking job. <laughs> um, and I wasn't really happy. Uh, the money was pretty good, but I wasn't really happy. Um, and VC work was, was better, yeah. um, but it, what, I didn't feel like I had found my calling yet. Um, and I didn't really go, go on like a spiritual journey or anything like that. I just thought a lot about it. and you know, like read some books, met some really like exciting people that were able to give me some career hmm. advice. And I, what, what's actually ended up happening is I've, I've kind of found that what I really love doing is, is building companies um, and, you know, hiring people and managing teams and, and seeing them do great things. And so, so, you know, it's what makes me most happy, which is why uh, I'm glad I ended up here. Is there like a particular moment that you look back and remember like, oh, that's the, that was like the straw that broke the camel's back. That was the moment that I was like, all right, I need, to, I need to go start my own company or do my own thing. Or was it more gradual? It was probably gradual, but I think things that contributed to that decision. So um, uh, I mentioned to you before. So I read uh, a book, which I don't really recommend at, a, at, a, <laughs> like a, at an overall content and message level. Okay. Uh, but it's a pretty well-known book called The 4-Hour Workweek, um, yeah. and a guy called Tim Ferriss wrote it. Um, I, my, my work weeks are sadly not four hours. Um, <laughs> they're about, you know. Does anybody here have a four-hour week? About 15 week? times that or, or 20 times that on most weeks. Um, but th there, was, there was a line that really stuck with me from that book, which is like, look, like, go pursue your dreams. You know, what's the worst that can happen? Yeah. And I think it's a really important framing mechanism. You know, what's the worst that could happen? Really, you could go get another job and you're probably more marketable than you were before and you've just like gotten off that treadmill so you can actually have some perspective. It's not unlike going to B school or, or, or anything like that or something like that where you can actually like take it as a time to really assess. Yeah. Um, Arguably a lot less financial risk than going to business school. It's much cheaper than going to business school. A lot of people don't realize that. Yeah. But I actually was just having this conversation with some of our um, customer service team last night. Um, going to B school is like enormously expensive. Yeah. And if you're not pretty sure what you want to get out of it or you're not sure that you want to change, you know, why not, in my view, um, I didn't go to B school so I would say this, um, but why not invest in, you know, some, some, some like life MBA, like life lessons, which is exactly, that's all I wanted to get out of it when I, when I first started. Um, and I mean, clearly it's worked out well for you. Um, I mean, One Fine Stay is doing quite well. Just raised another 40 million bucks like a month or so ago. It was, it was announced about a month ago. Okay. It was yeah. happened a little bit before that. Sure, yeah. fair enough. Um, cool, yeah, so it seems like, it seems, I mean, are you at a point now where you can look back and say, 
uh, you feel like that decision was worthwhile? I mean, what, how do you, I guess at this point, how do you define success? Do you consider yeah. yourself successful? Uh, this is getting deep, and, and I like that because I think about this stuff all the time. Um, so I, I don't. It's too early to say that it's been a financially successful move. Um, so we are, we're five, we're five years in. Excuse me, <clears throat> um, but we still don't know what the outcome is going to be. We think we're doing some great things. We know we're creating some really great customer experiences, um, but in terms of a you know economic success, we're just not going to know that yet. Um, Obviously, investors are excited about what we're doing, mm -hmm. um, which is a really great vote of confidence. But raising money is not what we're here doing. We're here right. building a business. Um, but I would certainly say, without a doubt, for me personally, it's been a, a tremendously great experience. Because I now feel like I know what it's like to build a business and to, and to, and to, you know, and to develop staff and like get up there every day and like, you know, have the, have the cold wind in my face. It's not safe. Yeah. You know, a Greg, my co-founder, used this analogy when, because we were both venture capitalists in London, that's how we actually know each other, um, of being locked in a four-star hotel room, which seems a little bit ridiculous, but that's what it kind of felt like for me as a, as, as a venture capitalist. So I feel like, you know, untethered and, okay. you know, kind of free, yeah. but... Um, Let your hair blow in the wind. I wish, yeah, that'd be nice. Uh, <laughs> you can lend me some. Um, but, um, but it's, on a personal level, just been great. Uh, so one of the really interesting things about uh, the most recent raise is that uh, Hilton Hotels, Hyatt, Hyatt yeah. excuse me, Hyatt, actually um, led the round, right? They did, yeah. Um, and so, I mean, that's got to be an interesting indicator of, uh, I, I don't know if it's of how far you've come or just um, maybe just like larger trends yeah. in the market right now. Um, I, yeah. I mean, how did that come about? So um, we've known the Hyatt guys for about, I want to say a year, but it's probably been longer than that. It's probably been 18 months. Okay. And um, they, had a, they have a guy um, who, I'm forgetting his last name now, but his name is Jeff, and he's their chief innovation officer. Yep. And Hyatt is a relatively progressive hotel group. I think actually a lot, many of the hotel groups are getting more and more progressive. Because they're sitting on the analyst calls with Airbnb's market cap like doubling every you know six months and now worth twenty five billion dollars, which is more than the market cap of most hotel groups, right. and getting asked you know what they're doing about the sharing economy, and for you know a long time there was like blank stares. They were doing nothing about the sharing economy for many years, and they're still not doing that much, to be fair. But there are groups like Hyatt who are starting to think about how to leverage whether it's sharing economy companies or innovative business models to make their guest experiences better. Um, so one example is um, Hyatt. I don't know if they've actually pulled this off but that, but yet, but they talk about integrating with Uber so that when you stay in a Hyatt hotel, um, they have some sort of a deal or whatever where Uber just shows up right outside so you don't have to wait on the taxi rank anymore. Yep. Um, they're, um, they're testing out like keyless entry technology for the rooms. There was actually just an article recently about you know, how long before the front desk of the hotel goes away. Because we all have the technology on our phones now to just zap right into the room. People know, you know the, the hotel can identify us. Right. Um, and I think we're another step on that continuum. So one of the things that we're testing out right now with Hyatt, which was publicly disclosed in, in an article, um, is for our guests who are arriving into London on long haul flights. I don't know if you've flown out to London, but you pretty much can't get there during the day. Okay. Um, most people arrive overnight, but most of our homes are not ready until 4 p.m. Mm -hmm. because they're homes and they need to be prepped, and often the homeowner's there literally the morning that we're going in and prepping the home for the guest. So the partnership that we're testing, which has been really positively received so far, has been super simple. Show up at the Hyatt, uh, I think it's called the Churchill, um, uh, Churchill Regency or something like that, which is right in the center of London. If your one fine save room or home isn't ready, you can use a Hyatt room. You can use the Hyatt facilities. You can freshen up. You could even take a nap. Um, but that's like a really simple way for us to test each other a little bit. Right. Um, but anyway, back to the investment. I mean, it, you know, over a series of months, we sort of evolved that discussion very naturally. And then the opportunity came up for them to um, invest. Um, and they decided that they wanted to do it. So for them, I think it's smart because they get an opportunity to get a, lot, like a little bit of an insider's view right. into a new economy hospitality business. 
no hotels are getting stakes in Airbnb at this point. It just ain't going to happen. Um, so it's been a nice relationship for us. Yeah, certainly positions them as a you know quote unquote innovative corporation and yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think that you know the the hotels are not yet feeling, uh, even though they say they will, and there's like you know hotel hotels fighting this a bit. Um, they're not really feeling in their occupancy numbers the Airbnb effect from what we can tell, um, but they will, I think. Yeah. Um, I mean, Airbnb is just a juggernaut. Hmm. Um, yeah, so, so we are going to jump into questions. Um, real quick, if anybody lost an iPhone, we actually found an iPhone. So, if, yeah? All right, so we have your iPhone. Um, Josh, who's raising his hand over there, is holding it so you can grab it from him after the event. Um, otherwise, someone would have won a free iPhone. Um, we do, so we do have a few questions from the audience to jump into. Reminder, if you do have a question at any time, hashtag StartupGrindNYC on Twitter. Um, so Scott Beaker, can you raise your hand? Uh, hey, Scott, how's it going? Um, so Scott's question is uh, a little more into the, the actual specifics of One Fine Stay. He yep. says, does operations include concierge, housekeeping, and engineering? I'm not sure what you mean by engineering. Like maintenance. maintenance. Yes. Um, so it definitely includes housekeeping and maintenance. So th just the service in a nutshell is we, when you, uh, when you sign up with One Fine Stay, we send someone to your home to do a full registration so that we can capture all the details about the home and operate it without you there as the homeowner. Um, so those are things as mundane as Wi-Fi codes and things as specific as uh, where do we put your linen when we put our own linen on the, on, on the beds for the guest because all of our homes come with high-end hotel grade linen. Um, so it absolutely includes housekeeping, so cleaning and prep prior to the guest's arrival. Not just cleaning because we do transform the home from a home into accommodation that a guest is willing to pay money to stay in. Um, and it absolutely includes ma maintenance and engineering. In fact, it's one of the value added things that we do, which is we can respond super quickly should something go wrong. There's a ridiculous amount of things that can go wrong in a home. Um, and even if your homes are incredibly nice, Wi-Fi knocks over, you know, um, there's a plumbing issue. I mean, this stuff is really, really common. And we're there to respond really quickly. And it's also important, by the way, for our homeowners or our hosts on the other side of the marketplace, that when they come home, we're there, should something happen, or should we need to rectify anything? In terms of concierge, it's kind of a yes and no answer. We're not particularly good at what I would call real high-end hotel concierge, getting people into the cool restaurants or, or any, you know, any kind of proprietary access. Um, we tested it for a while. What we found was that guests just didn't really want, at least our guests didn't really want that. Um, if what you're looking for is a really great concierge, I still don't think we're the best, we're the best hotel option or accommodation option for you. Um, but we do do recommendations and we do give guests, all of our guests, an iPhone um, for them to use while they're with us uh, that has local area recommendations that our host community actually populates. So we've kind of done a mobile digital version of concierge, but I wouldn't say it's traditional concierge in that respect. And is that phone network enabled? Like, can you actually make local phone calls? It's also available for local calls, exactly. Because okay. the idea is that a lot of our guests are long haul travelers. Right. Um, so they would have, to, like, international long haul. So they'd have, like, really egregious roaming and, 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 and call charges. So we wanted to just, like, remove that and make it a better experience. That's a really smart idea. Yeah. And must be fairly simple to execute. Ish. Ish. Yeah. Sure. Um, well, I guess uh, we can jump a little further. Uh, uh, what I'm wondering, I guess, is clearly you're providing a service in a way that uh, that Airbnb is not. You're, you're providing an experience where, like, you know, with Airbnb, you could show up and be renting a room from a like 18-year-old college student, or mm -hmm. you, like it's a little bit more of a wild card, right? Um, so, I guess the question is who your market is. Like, you're, uh, I mean, you must be going for a very, very different market from the average person looking to like. Uh, find a cheap place on Airbnb. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think our target market is probably, well, it's not probably, it's guests who would probably otherwise stay in a high-end hotel, mm. even though it's not exactly fit for purpose. 
So what I mean by that, so it's a lot of families. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of people who are here not just for a few days. Our average length of stay in New York is well over a week. It's almost two weeks um, at this point. Um, so you're not exactly talking about people who you would think would obviously stay in a hotel, but they didn't really have an alternative before. Right. Um, so, it, it, but, but, but it is, I think, more of a, like a four-star guest demographic um, for people that have not completely standard needs. Um, so families or groups being, being, being obvious. We also have some one beds in our inventory. Um, and I think our one beds are particularly popular with people who are staying for ex a slightly extended period of time. Right. I still think, I, I love staying in hotels, by the way, um, and it keeps, keeps us on our toes. Um, and for a two night stay in a city where you just gotta get in and gotta get out, um, hotels are exactly fit for purpose. Right. Yeah, like you might not have a lot of inventory right next to the airport or right next to a conference center, for example. No, so we have no inventory by the airport. Um, the interesting thing about residential in New York is um, there's not a lot in Midtown either. I mean, there are these like new mega condos going up in Midtown and there are some homes that we have in Midtown, but these are in the real neighborhoods where people live, um, which is not where you'd find t a typical hotel. Where it's not where most of the rooms in New York are. Yeah, so you're kind of offering a different experience too. Yeah. Um, cool, so we have a question from Leah P. Leah P, hey. Um, so her question is, have you experienced many problems with city government uh, regulation and pushback? Well, I guess, so we've covered the hotel industry side. Like yeah. she's asking about city regulation, government regulation, and then the pushback from hotels. I mean, yeah. are, there, are there any hotel chains who are like totally opposed to you or fighting you? and? as opposed to Hyatt, who's working with you? My question is, just wants to ask, is Well, so the best way to ask a question is on Twitter. And uh, Evan, are you able to stick around after the event to sure. chat yeah. with folks for a while, too? Yeah. Okay. My question is, like, how do you do it at all? Because 99.9% .9 of the buildings in the city are not the same as the buildings in the city. They allow only rent for a year or longer. Yeah. So how do you, like, how, how does it technically happen at all? I think that stat is not correct. Um, it's probably closer to 80%, so I, I take your point. Um, but there's still enough out there that actually work within our business model. So, I mean, there, there's, two, there's two levels of this, right? So there's city, city stroke state reg, uh, legislation, regulation, um, and then there's the way buildings work. Yeah. Um, so let me take those in turn. Yep. Um, so at the city government level, so New York is the most restrictive regulatory environment in the world for home sharing. Like, let's just put it out there. Like, it could be that, like, it, who knew that Munich was just as bad, but, but, because I've heard Munich is actually kind of bad. Um, but, um, but in terms of big cities where there's a lot of accommodation spend, it doesn't get much tougher than New York, which means that we've had to build a real keen um, supply focused team to figure out where are these homes that do kind of work within the regulatory environment. From a city um, um, relationship perspective, I mean, you, you can't. Our address is published on our website. I spend a lot of my time educating the mayor's office um, and the elected officials, so the city council, um, um, the state assembly, and the state senate on our business model. The regulatory environment as it exists in New York is not meant to target homeowners that are doing this on an occasional basis. So this is about rent regulated units or rentals that are being taken off the market. We don't really work with rentals. We certainly don't touch anything that's rent regulated. And what I'd say about you know, the rules in New York is we've been really careful to always be on the right side of what I would call the moral issue, which is not taking affordable housing off the market and not really working with homes, even if it's not affordable, that would otherwise be going to long-term tenants. So we don't really work with rentals. Now, you know, there's, it's never gonna be easy in a city where everyone's living on top of one another, um, and there's a lot of sensitivity, but, you know, Fred Wilson wrote this, uh, yeah, I'm sure you guys have heard of him, um, wrote a great post on this a few years ago. Our feeling on this topic is that the genie's out of the bottle. Um, there's widespread, unregulated um, home sharing or rentals happening without anybody accountable. All over the city tonight, probably 10,000 homes being rented through Airbnb and channels like that. Um, we didn't invent the market, but I think what we're doing is we're making it safe, secure, and controlled. We take guest vetting really seriously. 
Uh, there's a New York Times feature on us last month that talks about us actually partnering with buildings. So in many cases, we're actually formally partnering with buildings and we're giving them a share of the revenue. What buildings have said, and some care a lot more than others, uh, I don't think this is about to start um, exploding on Upper East Side, you know, co-op-ville. Um, but buildings want accountability. What they don't want is to come home on a Sunday night with, you know, the tourist who clearly is a tourist claiming that they're the cousin of whoever lives in 4C. Um, and that's not our business. So our business is really controlling that activity pretty tightly. From a building rules perspective, there are building rules. Newer condos typically have um, one-year minimum sublet periods. Um, Co-ops don't really have much by the way of minimums typically. In fact, they have maximums more often than minimums. Um, and we've had to maneuver within that cleverly. But I think what we found again is that buildings who are progressive on this issue realize that it's just not gonna go away. And that if you try to push it all underground, you're gonna kind of get the worst of all worlds where you have a lot of uncontrolled activity that the building isn't taxing or benefiting from. And there's no one you could call should something actually go wrong. So our feeling is Things take time to change. Disruption is often misunderstood when you first see it. But we're actually building, I think, really great alliances with um, homeowners and, and their buildings in New York. Um, and I think we have a pretty good relationship with the city of New York as well. We certainly have taken the time to get to know them. and They've taken the time to get to know us. Um, so an interesting kind of tangent question to that is from Lucy Sue, who's part of our events team. Um, she's asking about the sharing economy, saying, you know, given there's one fine stay, task rabbits, all these different uh, pieces of the sharing economy, um, where do you see the sharing economy next? And I guess I would, going next, and I guess I would add, you know, are we kind of at the pinnacle of the sharing economy, or do you think that we're in the middle of a transition and, and we're going to end up, like, going even further down this road? I, I do think... It I, I do think that um, fair and like nuanced rules for sharing economy businesses are going to be a theme over the next three to five years. Um, I don't believe we're at the pinnacle by any means. I think this is an inexorable trend. Um, I think like the, the traditional barriers of you know labor forces or you know um, in the case of TaskRabbit. Um, or um, you know the hotels. I mean, these things are being broken down, and you know I think the quicker we all embrace that reality, the better, because you can't regulate this stuff out of existence, really. Um, nor why would you want to? Because we're actually creating a really great experience that's not that competitive, actually, with hotels in our case. Um, but I do think a theme over the next three to five years is figuring out the the legit model um, to partner with some of these some of these innovators. Of, we're like the wimpiest out of all of them, by the way. I mean, we're really trying to play by nearly all the rules. Right. Um, but I do think that a framework for Airbnb rentals is going to be a theme over the next three to five years. Um, and I think that will actually allow it to proliferate. So I don't know how much more the market, uh, how much more room the market has to grow, how much more headroom there is without putting some fair play rules in place. But I think once we actually design frameworks for these businesses to thrive, um, I think they will thrive. Um, and it's going to be hard to call the end of Airbnb's growth, certainly based on past experience. I mean, it's been an unbelievable story. Um, so you're in four cities right now. Uh, I would say you're in some of the most progressive cities in the world, probably, in terms of how uh, you're, like, the consumers in your market are thinking about um, rentals. I mean, do you see a world in maybe 10 years from now where you're in 100 different cities? Yeah, so we're certainly intent on expanding to new cities. Mm -hmm. um, I think we all, we tend to think pretty carefully before we make expansion bets, which is why we've been around for, for, for five years, but we're only in four cities. The thing that you need to know is that the depth of the opportunity in those cities is just so massive that we could literally never go anywhere else and still build a huge business. Yeah. Um, inbound accommodation spend in New York last year was $10 billion, mm -hmm. right? So there's a lot to go after here. Um, but that's certainly not our ambition. Our ambition is to expand to more cities and potentially even non-cities or like, you know, more seasonal markets and things like that. Um, but I do think that the thing that we think pretty carefully about is what are we uniquely adding to the equation before we go anywhere. Um, 
And I think it's less obvious when you think about um, markets that have really great hotel options. Um, so I think about, I, the example I always use for this is Miami. Okay. There may be a great one fine state business for us to build in Miami. But I've stayed in hotels in Miami, they're really good at what they do. They offer what a lot of people want to buy in Miami, which is pools and beachfront access. Um, can we actually add something unique to that dialogue? And if not, what are we doing there? You know, we're here not to like make money only, right? We're here to provide a world-class experience for our guests, which is why our net promoter scores in cities like New York are double that of the, you know, of the, of the hospitality industry average. Um, so I think that's what we're always weighing. Great. Um, I guess, how do you like, there's one big area of the business I think we haven't really covered, which is you're a service-oriented business that uh, you're very high touch with your customers. How do you actually go about hiring, especially when you're in four different cities, and, and how, do you, how do you actually vet the people that you hire, both on a contract basis and full-time? Um, so we're, tr we're trying to basically make it a single hiring funnel so that we're kind of, it's the same it's the, same, um, it's the same vetting process. But we take hiring ludicrously seriously, and maybe that's like a personal personality thing of mine. Um, but we're certainly an organization that believes that it all starts with people. Um, and when you, get, when you get the best people in the room, great things happen. Um, we uh, need to think pretty carefully in our business about seasonal trends. So the summer is much busier than um, the fall. You don't want to carry the entire team into the fall, so we do invest in seasonal staff, setting expectations appropriately, but we invest in ramping up and ramping down for our peaks. Um, Christmas is another big peak where it's kind of all hands to the pumps. Um, but in terms of strategy, I mean, we need a talent strategy. We need to be good at a lot of different things to succeed in this business. Right. Building a customer service operation in New York is tremendously difficult. Um, it's something that we've tried various iterations of, um, and we're still kind of learning those lessons. Um, building a field operation, I mean, where, do you, where would you hire um, a head of field operations from in a business like One Fine Stay? There's nowhere to go. So you basically just have to hire people who are smart, who can figure it out, and who have the, that like people depth. Um, so that they can hire well and manage and motivate and also make the hard decisions when hard decisions have to be made around performance management. Um, we've had to hire data analysts. Um, we've had to figure out how you add supply in the world's most restrictive real estate market. Like all of this stuff has taken a lot of first principles thinking, super smart and motivated people. So that's why talent is kind of at the center of everything that we do. Um, Janelle Kulich actually has a tangential question. Where is, oh hey, Janelle. Um, so her question is, what internal productivity and collaboration tools do you use? Um, and I guess, again, you know, spread across four different cities, um, expanding to other cities, how do you kind of keep everybody on the same page? It's, it's really difficult. Um, we have, so we've just invested in great video conferencing technology. So I don't know if you guys have used Zoom, but it's been a really good, it's like a huge upgrade from Skype, G, chat, stuff or Google Hangout stuff. Um, we don't use Slack or any enterprise collaboration tool like that. Um, we do use in silos hip chats um, when we have like working groups that we all need to get in the same room on something. So hip chat's been a pretty useful tool. We use, uh, maybe because we're you know European originally, we use Skype um, to communicate a lot of IMs um, and Gchat and things like that as well. Um, but beyond that, there's no like large enterprise collaboration tool that we're, that we're using. Um, but I do think it's behavioral as much as a tool. So we know that we need to spend a lot of time with one another and we need to make sure that um, there are shared values and a shared culture across these companies. Uh, you know, I, I'm a huge Danny Meyer fan, so I don't know if you guys have read Setting the Table. Um, and he talks about when you expand, uh, when, when you open up a new restaurant, you got to have shared values. At the same time, it's OK for the staff of one restaurant to have more loyalty to Gramercy Tavern than Union Square Cafe. I think that's kind of similar in our business. I would imagine that, or you, you could ask our staff, there's a couple of them here tonight, um, uh, that there's more loyalty to the local operation than the global operation, while still always keeping one eye on the importance of best practice sharing, um, collaboration and global communication because there's best practices emerging all over the place. When you hire great people in all four cities and you haven't really figured out the operating template yet, 
it's tremendously important to know, hey, like Parrish has figured out this like great tool to measure, um, um, uh, to, 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 to track our host sales funnel. Like let's get some of that over here. Um, and I think eventually we'll centralize it all and we'll build out the technology to underpin the operation. We have like 30 engineers in London, we have technology. But I think if you, if you try to over-prescribe that stuff, it's, it's hard too. I do think though, had Slack been around five years ago when we were starting the company, we might have gotten one of those, one of those collaborations, because that's like, I've heard it's great, um, in quite a lot earlier and might just be, you know, might just be central to what we do now. But we don't have anything like that. Um, I love that you brought up Danny Meyer, because that really is a great book, Setting the Table. Um, if, for context, uh, if anybody doesn't know, Danny Meyer is uh, most well known probably for starting Shake Shack. Um, but actually started the Union Square Hospitality Group that owns a bunch, or started a bunch of restaurants around the city. It's probably the only restaurateur who has never failed at starting a restaurant. <laughs> yeah, well he's failed a couple times, has like he? with Tabla, yeah, okay, yeah, I didn't things know like that. that. But, but yeah. He's, he's, yeah, he's succeeded a lot more than he's failed, which Definitely. is pretty rare. Um, yeah. And it's a great book, Setting so the Table. So I want to give a big thank you again to Pivotal Labs for hosting us. A uh, big thank you for, uh, to JustWorks for being here and hanging out with us. Um, and of course, a big thank you to Evan Frank. Thanks. Thanks for having me. But I, I want to make sure you get your 30 seconds too. What do you guys need right now? Are you hiring? Are you looking for? What's, what's your 30 seconds? We need to get through the rest of the summer. That's, right. what, that's what we need to do. Um, we're always looking for great people. So yeah. absolutely. So um, we do have some open roles on the website, which some, some have seen. Um, and we're always looking to, to, to meet great folks. Um, we're always looking for uh, opportunities to work with buildings and, and, and kind of partner hmm. with others in the city, um, which is, you know, it takes like a certain amount of progressiveness. It doesn't always exist in New York real estate. So any opportunities like that um, are interesting. And the other interesting thing is we just hired a, uh, someone from the traditional real estate industry. Um, to focus on our real estate practice, which is really going to be about partnering with um, other brokers in the city for people who own pied de terres or homes that they're not often in, um, but they're sitting empty. Which you know, if you, there's a New York Times article about um, a year ago that you know something like a third of the apartments in New York are just empty, or wow. condos in New York right. are, are just empty. Um, so anything around New York, um, partnership opportunities and great people. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, another big round of applause for all of the event team and everybody who helped make the event possible. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming, everybody.